Welcome to Writer's Block with Miriam Kilmurray. This week's featured author is Sabrina George, the Deadologist. Ladies and gentlemen, you are very welcome to Writer's Block, and I'm delighted to have with me today Sabrina George. She is the debtologist, and we're going to feature her book today. Sabrina, you're very welcome. Welcome aboard. Thanks so much for inviting me onto your show. No problem. This is a fantastic book. I finished reading, reading the book this morning at about 11 o'clock. And it is just, it's just a must read. And for any of our viewers and listeners, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a, a taste of, of her background. Uh, if you have ever wondered why you find yourself in debt, then Sabrina George really is the person to talk to. My guest today spends so much time planning workshops and she's a consultant and an author of The Debtologist, our featured book. She gives honest, practical advice on how to get out of debt. She understands the behaviors and the vagueness of debtors, and she helps them find and set boundaries, both in their professional and their private lives. This book really fascinated me because the, the structure of it, apart from the subject matter, was great. I loved the way you structured the beginning of the book with all the witness testimonies and the examples of different kinds of person and different kinds of career and, and behaviors, behaviors that can very subtly lead you into debt without you even realizing you've gone down the road. It's a wonderful way to do it. Well, thanks, darling. It, um, I, I would um, say that pr the primary thing is, is not just the behaviors, it's the thinking. I would yes. say primary thing with people and when I, I have to sort of define debt which I do in the beginning of the book but a debtor is not someone temporarily in debt it's not someone who just you know horrible things have happened they've been left on the back uh, on the side of the road with nothing there are people who if they're really honest with themselves have a history and the history can go back in my case to pocket money you know it went back and back and back and I was just constantly thinking why does this keep happening to me yes um, and yep. the primary, um, you know, result I came up with is magical thinking or toxic thinking or um, complete lack of clarity and thinking. So I would just get up one day and I'm, I'm going to win an Oscar today. And if I hadn't done it by the end of the day, I was like, well, let's come up with something else. And I kept on having this nutty, which I still have, I haven't lost it. It's just, I can laugh at it now, but it's having that complete lack of clarity, that complete lack of planning, that complete, um, and to, to not even realize I was doing it. You know, that was what was so shocking. And I see it in other people very clearly. And I can step back and go, do you realize that there hasn't been a plan behind what you've just said it? You can have it, you can do it, but actually have you done any processes to get to that point? And they look at me like, what planning being specific yes coming down from the clouds and being like focused and what i started to see more and more clearly is people who are successful and that is under corona that is in states of of of, of um let's say cultures or areas of poverty is the ones that come out are the ones that have a very clear and i don't mean one focus you can have as many focuses as you like but they're going actually if I do this consistently and then I do this consistently, I might get a result. Yes. So lack of clarity, vagueness, you know, there's lots of terms for it, are one of the defining features of people who have a history of debt. And do you feel this starts very young? I, in my case, it probably did. Um, I don't know whether it's nature or nurture. I think sometimes it's a bit of both. Yes. You can have this, let's call him, because I have met a few, the spoilt princeling boy who mummy just, you know, of course, darling, you're a genius, you're wonderful, despite all the evidence showing he's <laughs> yeah. actually quite normal. Yes. Um, yeah. 
you know, so you'll have the princeling and the prince that prince. It's it's becoming obviously as equality slowly creeps in. We're having um, princesses as well. That used to be quite rare. So I think there's an element of nurture there. But I think also people just for whatever reason choose to escape into reality into unreality you know i call it um, in one of my um it's not actually in this book but one of my concepts is i call it the sort of fairy tale world of the data where you have the king of credit and the princes and princesses just keep going to the king and saying can i have some more money please can i have some more money please and then the king calls in the debt um so I'm trying to provide the uh, sort of gingerbread crumbs coming from that place down into reality and say, you know, just start very small ways, start being aware that this stuff is going on in your brain and you might start to hear it after a while. Um, and actually, when I am down in reality, my life is a thousand times more exciting than yes. it is in my fantasy. And yes, I, I agree yeah. with you. You couldn't write it. You couldn't write it when you do start to experience it. I totally agree with you on that one. And what, what I noticed early on in the book is that you brought in the pledge. Can you tell our viewers a little bit about that? Because that's fascinating. I didn't expect to see it, but the effect that it had on me was that it focused my mind. The, absolutely. Well, one of the, um, uh, I'll probably come back to this, but when I, was wanting i was basically being overwhelmed by people needing my help and i was just like i can't spread myself so i decided to write a book and i thought about it and i'm very very dyslexic i was like how do i and the main problem was a structure and so i took myself away um for uh, i think it was a month and i thought whatever happens i'm going to come back with a structure i might not have written anything but there's going to be a structure so i went I think it was on Google or one of them anyway, and I looked at the top, I can't remember, 10, you know, best-selling uh, self-help books. Yes. I didn't care what the help was for, but I just thought, let's look at them. So I took these and I took them away with me, and most of them I didn't really read, but I was flicking through them. And the funniest one was a book called um, Run, Fat Bitch, Run, I think, which was about learning to, oh no. Um, and I was like, there'll be nothing here. And she says in the beginning, she has this pledge, which is that I will every day I will run. Come rain, um, rain or shine, whatever happens, I will run. And I just thought, oh yeah, what's my pledge? And I thought my pledge is you have got to commit that you will absolutely not borrow or um, or, or beg or you know get overdrawn use a credit card all the forms now, that might take a while to find out what debt actually is but just with that focus okay today i'll get up today and today i will absolutely not get into any further debt yes because this is one of the things that i was finding it quite um challenging to get people to understand i'm not necessarily saying this will get you out of debt it will eventually Yes. It might take a long time, but that's not the main purpose. The main purpose is stop that behavior yes. and all sorts of extraordinary things come into play. I've met people, particularly in America, where you can get into unbelievable debt for medical issues. For oh, yes. yes, yeah. And they, they will have, so I don't know, let's say $5 million worth or something and their jobs are maybe, you know, I don't know, being a receptionist or being a concierge or something. They're not actually earning that much. But yes. once they stop the medical stuff, because a lot of it is a form of getting back into debt, um, extraordinary things start to happen to their lives. And they can, I call it, they park the debt they already have and that goes into a maintenance system, which is what I talk about in the book. Yes. And they get on with their lives. And that is the challenge, getting on with my life when I suddenly was like, I'm not obsessing, I'm not fantasizing, I'm not full of anxiety with all this craziness. It was just like, oh, what do I want? What do I really want to have in my life? And that is a challenge. So that's why I make it a pledge, you know, that you will not. Um, what, do, what's, what do I actually say here? That... I'll just take you to that if, if that's all right. Um, because, <laughs> I mean, I found I really found it very, very good because it did. It absolutely did. Uh, uh, what focus do I mind. Shall I read it? Yes, you can indeed. Absolutely. 
So I'm going to put my little scouts on her because, you know, there is tongue in cheek, although it's bloody <laughs> serious, it's a bit. So I, Sabrina, um, d uh, this is the do or die pledge, do solemnly declare and commit that I possess all the symptoms of being a chronic debtor and I will never again take out any sort of debt, be it for a cup of tea or a broken washing machine that is unsecured against anything else I own. I'll explain that later. I promise never to use a credit card, uh, never use credit in the shape of a credit card, bank loans or forwarded money from friends or relatives due any day now. I will no longer be seduced by free money. I will do whatever it takes to never take out a loan for any reason whatsoever. I will stop debting for the next 24 hours one daily commitment at a time and stop making excuses for myself. I am responsible for every penny I spend and every penny I make. I will take note of each penny spent by writing it down systematically and religiously. I swear by the deity of my choice that I will do all that is required to stop taking out or creating debt. Then I will move forward into a richer life, whatever that means to me. I promise always to get through this challenging time by attempting to keep my sense of humour. It's a hugely important thing. And then signed and dated. And if you can do that in the beginning of the book and keep coming back to it, going, what's she on about? Um, and hopefully the book then illuminates more and more. But as I'm, um, you know, I, you, I've got, I've covered the story of, of, of my switch, which was a long, long yes. time ago. And I just thought there's something weird about me and debt. It's not oh. about money, it's about debt. Yes. And that's where I started to read and unpick and talk to people and talk to people. And hopefully this book is, I mean, honestly, I, you can probably hear it in my voice. I can talk about hours. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know you, you've become such an expert in the last 20 years in particular. I mean, you, you turned your life around, didn't you? You, you had areas of expertise. You worked in film, you worked as an artist. There were lots of, I think you say at one stage that was it by the age of 30, you'd had about three different careers behind you. At least. At, at least. least. Yes. I got fired off so many jobs. I think I'm the queen <laughs> of getting fired. <laughs> Very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had I had many different starts at various different things, and again, it wasn't until I started looking at my thinking, my behaviour, my actions. One of my favourite things was to throw myself at Everest. Whatever it was, I would go for something where they hated yes. women, middle class. I had no education. You know, I, I was just I didn't know I was dyslexic till much later, but. For instance, I was a ship broker in the city and there was only, I think, four. Um, and the two of, one of those was um, Anassis's daughter. What, what I know, well, Christine. Oh, Anassis. yes, Christine. That was one of them. <laughs> and then there was another one, I think the surname was Niarchos, and then there was another girl and me. And we were the only women in the shipbroking world and we were taken off and plied with drinks. And my boss was constantly suggesting I go and sleep with clients. Um, oh my God. Yeah. There was quite a lot of sort of wine. Steam. Oh yes. Yes. I can imagine. It was absolutely awful. Um, so that was one thing. And then the second thing was that I was very dyslexic. So for instance, a client would say, could you go and find me a ship? I've got, uh, I can't remember, let's say 300,000, um, whatever tons of, of cargo. And I'd go absolutely fine. And I'd find something for 300. I had no concept of right. I mean, looking back, it was hilarious. And they thought I was an idiot. And I was just like, oh, I'm just not concentrating enough. So I wasn't ever going to be any good at the job anyway. But I had this layer upon layer. But I thought that's where the But one did you? Because I find that very interesting. Because I also, when I was very young, was told that I was mildly dyslectic. Um, and it did affect the way I went about things and the way I had confidence in myself afterwards. And later on, I discovered actually that I didn't have it, that it was basically, it was uh, an issue with the pupils of my eyes being more oval than circular. I know that the astigmatisms, they call them. Um, but my mother was very anti-glasses, so I never had eye tests. So I went through this period of my youth wondering, 
wondering about this because I knew that I had been told this at school, so I took it as read. And it kind of forces you when you're told something like that to become more creative and inventive in other ways. And you are so confident, you come across as such a confident person that I'm sure people probably thought to themselves, hang on, is she actually having this on here? Or is, you know, is what she says, because you sell yourself so well. Well, this, this is also something that I find a lot of people who debt do. So they go into the bank and they, yeah, of course I need a kitchen. And the yes. bank goes, well, you seem to have borrowed enough money to maybe about 10 kitchens. Oh, I know, but this happened. And we can present ourselves really well. And this is why oh, yes. it's really hard for other people to see it, which is why, again, in the book, I've tried to put symptoms for those who may be partnered by, parent of, child of, yes. or even employing or being employed. I had um, a guy in New York, he was a, 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 let's say physiotherapist, I can't remember. And he said to me, can I talk to you? He said, you know, I'm very highly, he, he was very dry, very honest. Can I talk to you? I, I have um, a lot of clients, I spend a lot of marketing, but they don't tend to come back. And I was sort of listening to him talking and I said, can I describe your clinic? And I said, there'll be no flowers. I said, there'll be some sort of cheap laminate. The floor will be some sort of nasty lino or something. I said, yes. you'll have towels that, you know, maybe could have seen better days and you'll bring them out of a cold cupboard. And, and he was looking at me and he said, why have you been there? And I said, no, that's the sort of lack of you know spending appropriately that the client you had him you had him right there <laughs> and I, 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 I call it sometimes i can smell it i don't have to look at the books to go something's not yes you know it's like i don't i, don't, I, can't, I don't know that it's impacted on ireland but anyone who's been to woolworths for the last 10 years before it went down yes who i'm walking it was just like really really is this you know, and it, it went down and we just heard of another chain, various chains that have gone down under Corona. And I was like, hmm, who knew? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, it's impacted here, too. We had Woolworths here at one stage, actually, in my time. Massive, massive problem. And you see Primark and not Primark, what's the other one? Pound Shop coming up. And yes, they weren't that fancy, but they were nearly half the price. And this is what and I see this with an individual. You have know, people who will talk to you like this. And they'll say, I work in the city. And then I realise they've got no teeth and because I'm into the dentist. Yeah. Or, you know, <laughs> someone who's like, oh, I'm terribly important in something. And their glasses will be held together with a safety pin. And this kind of is the, the, the sort of nuances of what gives debtors away. And they think people can't see it. And maybe people aren't conscious. But there is a way that we communicate with each other that oh, we don't yes. see. And it's always the person who goes with you who's forgotten their purse, hasn't got cash out, they're a bit short this week, yep. or they do the opposite and they're always picking up the bill to the point where it's slightly irritating. You're like, what are you doing there? Yes. And you find a that can't be earning that much more than you are. So Absolutely. you'll get the mirror of the same, you'll have this very flashness or you'll have the constantly uh, borrowing so that's why the pledge is a starting point because it makes me think all the time am i asking for this directly could you give me that or yes. am i going uh, please i can't afford oh can i <laughs> um and i don't no, i i think you're absolutely right there and where you go from there is quite interesting too because very early on in the book you do slip in that word that a lot of people won't expect which is suicide mm. you know and you do that in the early pages and it kind mm. of it gives you a bit of a start for a minute because of course there are people who've got those millions but even if they don't have millions of debt people who just feel suicide is going to be my only option here i cannot possibly crawl out from under this rock i cannot admit to my relatives my friends again that I failed. I you heard about that horrendous case, I think it was about 10 years ago in Shropshire, and the guy was worth squillions and he had a big estate, he had horses and, he had, and his daughter was, um, I think a teenager, but she was riding horses, 
you know, for trials and winning awards and whatever, and his wife and everybody adored each other. It was absolutely wonderful. And he, I think it was after 2007, I can't, I can't remember the exact, but he appears to have gone home and shot his wife and his daughter and then the dogs and then the horses and then he set the whole place alight and then he shot himself because he was so frightened of going to them and saying we have to downsize yeah we have to kind of close things down he just could not bear it so sometimes it's the fear of debt even though the debt doesn't exist and it's just this sort of like yeah spend whatever you like spend whatever you like i'll i'll manage it i'll manage it and then when they have to go, actually, I can't. You know, the stories, I don't remember, in the 80s of people going to work and they'd lost their job and they would just yes. sit in the cafe. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so it hit the Japanese. Do you remember the Japanese got really seriously hit? You'll remember that, I'm sure, when you were working in the city, you had Japanese businessmen who were basically not telling their wives, going to work every day in their suits with their attache cases and faking work, coming home then, not telling anybody anything. That was very, very big in the 80s. And Can that's you... why I'm big on, on I, and I know a lot of the debt charities say it all, all the time, they say, tell somebody. Um, and it's, in my experience, when I was trying to come out of this fog, it was like, well, who do I tell? Yes. What do I say? And how do I express myself? And everybody thinks X and I'm just a twat for having got myself in this situation. And so I fear, I'm hoping with the book that people will start to have a language and just go, I don't know what's going on. And that is a beginning. Yes. You know, Samaritans have a lot of people who call up about um, financial messes. And my experience is nothing is too bad to be sorted out nothing yes. yeah it's overwhelming and you see it's... this is what you do in the book very early you get that message in in the first 15 pages you get that message across and that's what i really liked about the book because you didn't go in with um a financial language and a series of plans uh, that you'd nearly need a financial masters to be able to work out which so many of these things can be a bit like that your language is human you are dealing with people mm -hmm. and they could be millionaires or they could be someone on 34 grand a year but mm -hmm. they're all in the same situation where they've been stretched to their limit utter limit well one of my um i have a metaphor in my head of a of a possibly an asian lady or something who's been in the country for 30 years i meet her at the top of a double decker bus she can speak perfectly good english but there's no jargon there's yeah. no references to my culture so she will understand perfectly if i speak to her in very plain simple english yeah. and i don't start because this again i found particularly the american ones they're so jargon led that yes. i don't know what they're talking about i just don't yeah. know what they're talking about so this was a very important um premise that this lady that i fictionally met on the top of the bus should be able to read it yes Yes, absolutely. And you've got a particular uh, one, one young, one young man, I presume he's a young man, um, very early on, he just gets to the point where he, he, you give him the words to say to his family, that he actually goes to his family and he says, look, do not lend me any more money, no matter how much I ask for it, do not lend me any more money. I'm, a, this is what I'm addressing it. And you, you like this, what I like about the way you've brought in these stories is that you, you are drip feeding people. The language they need to start as well so you've got them you've got them signing the pledge you've got them thinking about what it is they're reading right now and that that this is for them and you're also drip feeding language that they need to approach their friends with and they may end up finding that their friends are fair weather friends and don't particularly want to know them afterwards but that's a risk you've got to take isn't it that you've got to be able to kind of say well i'm going to start this process now and i might lose i might lose something but i'll gain more I would agree in retrospect. I think at the time, if someone had told me I was losing, I would lose friends. I probably, I don't know what I would have done, but that was kind of the reason I was doing it was to impress my friends. Um, and I think that can happen. What I, I would say is more that your social life starts to shift. So you might not lose, lose them, but they might move a few steps back. And what you then find is other people come forward who you would have thought, 
you know, we're not your friends. And then you find they've been standing by watching you behave like an idiot for years. And they suddenly, oh, thank God, we can now step in and make some Yes. Decisions. And they've got more to say to you and they've got advice for you. And they, they're, I mean, I can quite see how that would be the case. You've got to, um, I, I just want to pick up on a couple of things from the book, if I, if I can. You talk about the debtor's earworm. The debtor's earworm. It says, the debtor's earworm never truly leaves. It will always be chattering away to interrupt us, to get rid of our money and further into debt. That's a lovely, lovely way to put it, the earworm. And we can all recognize that. I can recognize that in my life. I'm sure everybody will immediately identify with this, this thing that, oh, it'll be fine. Yes, tomorrow we'll win the lottery. Tomorrow, I think it happens with um, with gamblers as well. As well, but I mean, it's it's a bit different. But I have people who say, "Oh, but you've got to speculate to accumulate." Yes. Okay. Yeah. And how's that working for you? Or where did you hear that? The guy in the corner of the pub living on benefits. Oh, okay. Well, you know, I haven't heard that uh, from anyone who's doing well. And this is something, again, I must say in the book, it's not like this is how you become a millionaire. This is more like, how do you get your best life? How yes. do you start actually doing the things you really didn't know you you were too frightened of or you didn't want to admit to yourself? I mean, one guy last... Um, about five weeks ago, um, he was in the in the um, hospitality business and obviously everything crashed. And so we were trying to come up with ideas of what he could do to keep earning some money. Yes. Unbeknownst to me, he was at art college years ago and his dream was to produce our, um, a book of illustrations. He's been putting them on Instagram. So he said to me about five weeks ago, he posted this you know book thing on Instagram at eight in the morning, not, you know, not expecting anything to happen. Two thousand pounds worth of sales at the end of the day. What? No. And he came up with this um, description, or he said, "Isn't it funny? I've had to have everything stripped away to do what I always wanted to do." And he hadn't told me. I didn't know any of this, so I was plugging away with the hospitality, going, "Well, let's try this. Let's try that." And this is what I find is when you clear away all the debris yes. and that can be quite painful to put your hand up and go, actually, I'd love to do this or this is where I'd like to be in my life. Oh. Yeah. And you have a reference to that in the book. You're talking a very similar thing. You say, I started with the horror of where I was and gradually started to see tiny chinks of hope that expanded into whole vistas stretching out before me. Isn't that rather poetic? It is, and that's you. <laughs> it's, but it's, it's great because it is absolutely true. You know, it just takes something very small like that. Can I ask you just to, um, just to, to deviate a little bit? Social media at the moment, how much of that is complicating things? If you've got someone who's really at their limit and they're afraid of, of, the, of extra damage, is social media causing more damage now? Um... <sighs> I would, I mean, I started all this before social media. Yes. Would it have been good or bad? I don't know. I think um, in a way I was quite lucky because I kind of had to fight and claw my way for information and finding people and trying all these, you know, and I had to go to the library, for instance, to get a book. I was a, one of the earlier users of Amazon when it first came out, but that was mainly to sell books. So, um, there, I mean, I have literally, because I was getting into a, such a muddle with this book, I have, you know, another pro, um, company which, which is now earning me an unearned income, and this is my big baby, and I thought, yes. I might not earn any money for quite some time, so now, as of now, I'm starting to face the challenge of social media, and there's been a few things, I've been putting feelers out, you know, trying things. Yes. And, vitriol that has come from some people at the very idea that I should suggest you stop borrowing money. And I'm just, Oh, really? Yeah. And I've seen that with individuals I've worked with. They've got very, very angry, but you don't understand. I come from an ex background or this happened to me. Or this, and I'm just like, well, you know, it's your option. I'm not. I'm the yes, lawyer. you're not forcing it, but it makes perfect sense to me. What you're saying makes perfect sense. Cutting up the credit cards, actually taking that risk, getting all of your debt under control by, by cutting up credit cards and, and stopping 
Now, just, just, uh, just a point. Would you also consider something like credit unions to be something that people, yeah, yeah so they'd fall into that bracket too? Yeah, credit unions, you actually, you, you pay up front generally. Um, yes. And then, uh, the, or they will, I mean, again, I'm, I, I would say try not to borrow anything and what, you know, I've, as I say, I had, um, when lockdown happened, I had no floors. I was literally homeless for a week, which is hilarious. Um, and I had these lovely Romanians who thought it was a conspiracy doing my floors, but I literally had nowhere to go. So <clears throat> I've had to kind of, you know, throw everything, all my possessions in the air and look at them again and going, why am I carrying that around? Why have I got that? Yes. And, yes. and I'm realising there's, uh, you can't see behind here, but there's a whole load of sheets and, and, uh, uh, and towels. And I think it's probably enough for a family of 10. <laughs> and it's really interesting when you keep looking at it and you're going, God, I've actually got a lot of things. I haven't, I went to buy a bra this morning, breaking news. Um, <laughs> the, shop, the shop was closed having said I had an, app had an appointment I didn't um, uh, because you know um, I like everybody my clothes are beginning to wear out and I'm going isn't this interesting to be in a situation where I mean yes we're not going out but actually I've got enough I've got, got enough yes out. yes a big lesson that we're all learning in this lockdown that we can survive on less and I, I think that message hit home in around about six weeks six or seven we can actually survive on far less than we thought we could. And it doesn't mean that you can't have the fabulous pink tutu when you're ready yes. and come out and look like a butterfly and go, oh, I've got all this new stuff. It's not, you know, I'm not saying you should live like, you know, um, uh, in a, m a monk's habit or something. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I know you're not. And that's very clear in the book too. And, and you move quickly onto things that can help people. Okay, you mentioned basic things like um, cutting up credit cards. Um, but I would just ask you, can I, can I ask uh, the importance of a credit rating these days? Okay. It's one of the- Tell me um, more. <laughs> yes, I don't want to get into conspiracy theories, but a credit rating actually serves you virtually nothing. Okay. If if you have no debt, you've got a deposit and you've got um, uh, an income, somebody will lend you money. You know, somebody will lend you money. I'm in a situation where, you know, I'm now very prosperous. There's lots of good things. And I, I was offered a free credit rating or something. This was about four months ago. This is before lockdown. And I looked it up and I'm red. I'm a disaster as far as the credit rating is concerned. But I could pick up the phone tomorrow and say, any chance, you know, you could help me get a mortgage or whatever. And people will give me money. That's absolute in my experience twaddle and i watch people struggling so hard and worry about their credit rating and yet the things that make a difference have you had a job for a period of time have you lived in the same place and registered on the electoral vote on roll Ooh. yeah yeah. Have, you, yeah have you been servicing your bills in mean, the different there's debt and then there's the word solvency, which is quite confusing to people. Being solvent doesn't mean out of debt. It means you're servicing your debts. You're keeping everything going. Now, that is super important. That's a super important point that you've made there. It's hugely different. And one of the ways you can help your, if you've got an extreme debt situation, is you can nearly always I have not found an exception. Renegotiate the terms you pay your debt back. Yes. So you can bring the interest down so you can have it frozen for a period of time. And I've known people, um, someone I worked with only a couple of years ago, I think she was about 170,000 in debt on credit cards, all different ones, all massive interest. And she got each one to agree that they would accept five pounds a month with no interest. And that's what she did while she got on with service getting her life back on track and her company as it was um which she did and i think she still owes i think she's still got quite a lot of debt but she's just quietly it's solvent and she's quietly dealing with that on the side and that's really really important yes and because you've got to live in the meantime don't you most people have their debt here and they everywhere they look they just go duh, 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 help help i can't it's not going to work when you say let's park it there 
And yes, we have to deal with it, but we can deal with it in small amounts. We get a plan, we get regular. I mean, it's terribly boring, which debtors hate. We like drama. But you just keep it going like that. And then you go, oh my God, there's a whole life in front of me. Um, and that is, in, in, again, an incredibly important switch because a lot of the um, insolvency or debt, not all of them, some of the charities are fantastic. They will work very hard for you to rush to pay off your debt. And, and is there a danger that you can go on too many registers? Uh, the registers of, of these organizations who are there to help people who are in debt? Does that in itself work against you? Um, I think it helps you get muddled. And as I say, we're the queen, I'm the queen of muddles. So I think, you know, uh, the Christians Against Poverty are very good and citizens, not citizens, in here it's called, I know it's the same in Ireland, it's called Step Change. Yes. Those are two really good ones. But interestingly enough, I think it was in October, um, Christians Against Poverty uh, said they were closing their doors for six months. They were so overwhelmed. Mm. They were so overwhelmed and of course we know that's not going to be helped now but they also said which was the thing where i come in is they said some of the people when they got them out of debt they got things solvent and going really well they were coming back with even more debt and i was like those are my people those are my people yes <laughs> not everyone who gets into debt you know stays in that lifestyle choice i'm that fat i deal with the faction of people who are consistently going back into it consistently need another degree they're 56 and they've got another degree they um i know those people <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know those people and they're not earning any more because they're now overqualified for things well, that's what they say. They're not overqualified. They just don't do what they are qualified to do. You know, I've met people in coffee shops who are doing a PhD and you go, are they overqualified? Are they? They're paying for it. Yes. They are moving forward. And in that you know, process, when their PhD and whatever it is comes through, they will have a plan. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I completely agree with you on that. And, and you know, there's, because there's an addictiveness to it. There's sometimes an addictiveness to study. There's sometimes you, ha you have to watch that side of yourself. Something else that you raise in the book, if I can just go to there, and, and it's, it's this thing. The first thing I want to raise is negative chatter that you talk about and the cutting up, uh, no, excuse me, the writing down of everything. Oof. Writing down what you spend. Negative chatter, gosh, as well, I get older, I'm aware of it too. <laughs> They do kind of go hand in hand. So um, let's talk about the negative chatter. It's all, all artists are poor. All actors are unemployed. Um, property's too expensive. Well, of course, nobody can afford to send their children to private school. Well, you know, uh, um, Charity shops are, are infiltrated with bed, bed bugs. Whatever it is, there'll be a reason why you can't do it and you've got to go to the other route, blow the money, do whatever. Yes. You only yes. live once. That's another one I hear quite a lot. And I'm going, you're 23. <laughs> um, a lot of living to do. And they're like, no, so they've got to go on holiday five times a year on their credit cards. So that is... Um, something again it's more about listening to my language listening to the way I think and going yes. can I just actually check that with myself oh well the press all says property I mean I do one this is my other business is property and I've just been with my letting agency this morning we're re-renting out a couple of properties the rent hasn't gone down at all but all the press in London is saying it's gone down massively and I'm like maybe I'm lucky or maybe the press is wrong or maybe they're talking about the high-end stuff which I'm not you know I don't know but but either way somebody's going to hijack the cliche if and... they want to think that way hmm. exactly exactly so uh, I get that a lot so I have a little list when someone I'm an art, they always have their head on the side I'm an artist and all artists are poor and I'm going okay and I go boom 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 and give them a list of artists who are millionaires <laughs> well they've sold out and I'm going okay sell out then well um you know and you can go yeah. down that 
road of just negative thinking. So one of the best thing, the tools I, I really, really suggest is right from the off, you can do it today, is write down everything you spent. I still use my final effects. Some people like apps. I don't like apps. So I have, in fact, I started this year, but I haven't got very far with it, a little blue book. But these are like 50p or something. Or you can make one out of A4 sheets of paper. So you don't borrow. So you write down everything you spend. Everything. And this, again, in the, in the book, I go into a lot of detail. You really, really write everything down. And I can't tell you how i don't know why but i see it in so many people that it must be a thing i was completely like this at the very thought of writing it down or anybody seeing it i was yes, you mentioned that a lot in the book there are a lot of people feel embarrassed at writing down you know to the onlooker they could be writing anything they could be writing simply you know their their diary they could be writing a poem they could be writing anything and not to know necessarily, I suppose the context will dictate it. You mentioned at one stage, if you write it down at a till, <laughs> then it's a giveaway. But really, it's a fantastic idea. It works for people who are trying to do weight loss. Why shouldn't it work for, you well, know, it, it, back when you're writing down for the sixth time in a day that you've bought a pair of socks, you start to go, that's funny. Start to realise, yes. Five socks previously, you forgot. Uh, and so writing everything down is the starting point. And those are what I call your records. And then when you're ready, you turn those into a plan so that you get an idea of what you actually need. And I'm talking, there's a difference between need and want, what you need to not debt. And yes. what's shocking is some of us go, bloody hell, that's not very much. I thought I need, I wanted, I needed, was all muddled up. So that's one of the tools I find very helpful. And then you, you write down, you know, what you actually need. And over a, a let, I prefer a week. My brain's got very short term memory. And a month I could just get confused. So I write down every week, I get on a Monday morning, I go, I've got to hit that target to not. Right. Get. Yeah. Okay. And that's based on my own evidence. That's not based on other people telling me. And that's the difference between a budget, which is what a lot of these charities give us. And yes. Why, well, actually, I mean, an example was, um, I was, it was suggested I spend, I think it was 35 pounds a week on restaurants. And I don't really care about restaurants. I'll go, but I'm not that bothered. But I love going to coffee shops with mates. I love just stopping on this. Oh, should we pop in? So, I had something like, I can't remember, four pounds for coffee shops, 35 pounds for restaurants. And I couldn't do it. I was like, both. So I switched them around and that was fine. And I still spend about 35 pounds a week. It's not even that much, but on coffee shops and I'm using it as my office. I meet people there. I have friends, whatever. So that's anyway. So by doing this, I started to collect my own evidence of what I needed, what I was doing, where I was going. And what started to happen was I would say, there are no jobs. And then I'd go, somebody's just offered me a job that meets those figures. This is gonna cost too much. Yes. I've got the money. And slowly, bit by bit, I realized that my brain was running this negative interference with the evidence. Right by writing everything down and then creating a plan. And I would suggest you do this step by step and really slowly because there's a kind of a sound barrier feeling when you get through it and you go, oh my God, I stopped dating. Oh my God, I've started to be able to afford the things I want to have and my life is starting to expand. And it can be very emotional. I went through a lot of grief when I came out of debt. I had a year- Did you? Yes. You and uh, what kind of grief are you talking about there? Is it the loss of things or, or relationships or? I think it was, it might have been. I, I really don't know because it was very strange. I only realized when I came out of it that there was a sort of sense of how much I'd lost before by my Oh, birth. yes, yes. The opportunities, the people I'd met, things that I could have, um, you know, really flown with where my yeah. behavior, my thinking you know, yes, and yes I totally understand that. Totally understand that. The realization, yeah, of the time lost, lost and what could have been. And bewilderment was another one. I was just like, why am I so weird? <laughs> 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 am 
I'm so odd. Um, and then, to, you know, to find other people who were like that and just go, do you feel really peculiar about, you know, walking into a shop and just saying, can I have this? And I've got the money and I pay for it in cash and I write it down. I go, yeah, it's really strange. <laughs> you go, it's not, it's not. So mm. that's very much, um, those two are kind of twofold is start writing down your reality in as much detail as possible. And again, there's a lot more detail to that. Yes. And the flip side is you'll start to get the evidence to say that a lot of my thinking was not correct and it was negative or it was very, it had a very single singular slant to it, which was yeah. Sabrina had a special, you know, remember the, um, the Monty Python um, boot? Yes. <laughs> I had this special boot, which was constantly following me around my life and thump, thump, thump. And I didn't, I didn't, but it's the way I thought. Yeah, because I remember in chapter two, you talk about, I don't know if it's actually the same thing, but you talk about the old ways trying to lure you back and get your attention. Um, old thoughts and actions of the debtor l trying their best to lure you back when you've made the breakthrough. Yes, the earworm, the um, habitual practice of people I might be around. I mean, as I say, there's people I'm still in contact with who were just as bad as me and they watched changes. I, I didn't necessarily tell them. I mean, most of them know now because of the book, but I just watched their behavior continue and they doing whatever they want to do. It never got bad enough for them to change it. But how few have said, Sabrina used to be a real idiot with money and now you seem to be doing all right. Um, that very rarely happens. And what I see from them is, come on, let's all go off to the Caribbean. We'll just get a nice five-star hotel with an infinity pool. And I'm like, really? On what? On what you go? I can afford it, can you? And they're like, oh, we'll just flash the card. And then I come up with my awful six gun thing where I say, do you know what? It's not my cup of tea. That is just not my kind of a, an idea of a holiday. And that's like, oh, and then I say, what really is your idea of a holiday? Yeah. And, you and there's a difference between that and, and procrastination, isn't there? Because you, you were talking about that as well in the book, people who procrastinate. And it's, you know, it's not that you don't want to engage or move ahead. You've just now realized there's a better way. I have drive to do other things now. Hopefully, hopefully, I think I get a lot of that. Oh, I'm just lazy. I'm just, you know, bored. And I'm going, I don't think you are. I think you maybe haven't got a plan. Maybe you are still in that, you know, cloud and fuzzy, magical thinking world. And yes. what I'm suggesting is just come down a little bit and then suddenly an action will appear. I mean, this is my favorite. This is my little pile of paperwork. <laughs> of things you can see I've spilled coffee on it but these are things that this is all my paperwork that's left and normally I, in the old days I would have had passed most of this is waiting on another side's action yeah so I'm I'm not I'm not I can't action this and now in the old days I would sit there with piles like this some of it would just be sales junk mail but I would just be I've got to deal with it but when yes. I started to really field it now I have um, very little to do. And um, as you know, in the book, I have a 20 minute a day. Don't do more than that. Okay? Yes. And you seem to have discovered that you, it took you 20 minutes very early on. I don't know where I got that from. I was reading so many books. I mean, I, I did a bibliography and I thought, I know there's a lot more than those. But somewhere there's 20 minutes a day because most debtors, you know, for instance, taxes, for instance, at, well, anything, we will leave it until five the last minute. minutes. Till midnight and then we go, and we have a week of hell and then I found that if I did 20 minutes every single day writing things down putting it into my um, spending records dealing with my mail um, I don't use that 20 minutes you know now in the beginning I did but I've also started to retrain my brain that admin is not that bad it's a bit dull but it's not that bad. And this one woman I worked with, I think she was 10 years behind on her taxes and it took her two years. She was brilliant. She just doggedly got through it all. And um, unfortunately she moved up north or something. I'm not in contact, but yeah, she became a specialist on personal tax. She was amazing. She'd bring up the tax office to go, what do I do about this? 
20 minutes every day. Meanwhile, her income went up, her relationship with her husband improved dramatically. That's partly why they moved up. But I was just watching it thinking, I wonder whether she'll do it. She did it. 10 years it took her instead of grinding through possibly three or four weeks of absolute misery getting it wrong and she's retrained that it's fine just and you fine. mention at one stage too just talking about writing everything down you say the first thing i observed was that my head my mind seemed less busy i did not have random thoughts crashing around in my mind i did not have to even try to remember what i spent or how much it cost I no longer had to do calculations in my head. It was all there in writing for me to refer to. And it's like it freed up your brain. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think um, I, I used to, even though I'm dyslexic, have a walking calculator in my head. So yeah. if I earn that, I've already spent it and I owe that. So then I want this and then I'll do this. And if I move that to that, all absolute rubbish, all incorrect. And I was per perpetually, and I thought that was normal. I really thought that was normal. And now people say, how much do you earn? I'm going to have to find out for my spreadsheet. How much is this? I don't know, I have to find out for my spreadsheet. As long as I hit those targets, which I have done for many, many years now, um, how much did it cost for the book to come out? <laughs> Can't remember, it's on my spreadsheet. And I love that. So when I make a financial decision, I look at my spreadsheet, I make the decision, I spend the money or whatever, and I'll forget about it. Yeah. Don't mm -hmm. have to go, oh God, you know, how am I going to deal with that? Or do I want to or don't? All of it's based on, do I have the money? Do I have the choice? And I have no debt. I've no debt for since 97. So it's a long time. Yeah. Um, Fabulous. It's fabulous, really. And the thing is, you, you have found the language to get that across. And, and, and that's what so many of these authors fail on. Um, and the advice is so solid. Just from the point of view of, I mean, you took on the project of actually writing this book and you waited until you had the expertise and years of it before you started to do this. And you obviously thought long and hard about the form and the shape of the book. And I think you've hit on the right form and shape. Um, because it's not a complicated, heavy, heavy read. It's a really interesting and engaging read, and that's what you want. Thank you. Yeah. So is it, is it something, is, was the actual process of publishing this book then daunting at all to you? Yes. <laughs> In a word, yes. Yeah, as I say, I, I got to the point where I was spending so much time on the phone dealing with people and you know talking them down from the tree and explaining explaining and i thought you know so bit by bit i started to come up with various formulas like the spending plan and and like the 20 minutes and i was thinking you know and I, you can't tell but i'm um, someone who's perpetually lifetime reading diet books and i don't even have that experience you get books 500 pages and you go oh this is going to be fabulous 300 pages will be telling you you're fat why it's not good to be fat and then you get the 200 pages and you're like they haven't told me how to not be fat yes so i used to get so cross with this and i thought i want a similar book on on uh, how to get um to stop being uh, a to stop acting like a data and uh, get a life and um and I thought I want to go straight into the, the nitty gritty. And it started off, I think, about two thirds and now we've expanded it. And as I say, I took the model of that fat run book, fat, would you run, fat, bitch, run. Um, and I took that as a model and it was actually wonderful because I took myself, it's one of my favourite types of holidays to go on a road trip for a month in Europe. Yes. With a dog and we just have adventures. So I was in Tuscany in this sort of... Um, I don't know, cave in the side. It was beautiful. It was a lovely flat, but it was in this. So it's very cool. And I would write in the morning and then the afternoon go and explore. It was wonderful. And, uh, and every morning I'd sit there with my dyslexic thing, typing away, coming up with stuff, um, following this model. Um, and then I brought it back and I kept writing again, not more than 20 minutes sometimes. And just kept writing and writing and writing until I had enough words and then I took, I, it's been through about four or five different editors who've mainly been checking the spelling and the grammar. But as you know, most of these grammar checks 
don't necessarily mean the sentences make sense. And then I got with the publisher I'm with now, a guy called Lenny Allen, and he said, can we look at the restructuring? And I was like, yeah, absolutely, because he's the one who I think's come up with the final structure and done a really good job of it. Um, because it made sense and it was English, but he really helped in making yeah. it clearer and for the structure. Well, uh, but it still sounds like you. I mean, as I'm speaking to you now, I can't see a big difference between the voice I, I get from the book as I read the book and, and you. He's kept true to that. Yes, no, the text was, the text was all mine. Yes. What he did was just change the uh, order in which the stories were, and he compiled them in a slightly different way than the way I had originally done it. But I was, you know, you, your, your show's called Writer's Block. I was so blocked in how I put this together. And I was like, you know, all these different bits. Um, and that's why, as I said, I took these 10 top ones and I was flicking through until I found a model. I thought, I've just got to find a model. Yes. I stick to it in the end, just a model will do. And then I started writing on that basis. And then someone like Lenny could look at it and just reshape it and put it into, um, it's still my, all my own text, but he put the chapters and he said, let's put the stories in the front. Yes. And the pledge in the front. And he, he uh, structured it differently. Yeah, and that was a very good idea. And, and, and also you had to, this is, this is what's difficult because I, I, I publish as an indie author. Because I still haven't got that 100% total trust in handing over my baby to somebody else. It's a really hard thing to do. It really is to, to lose a little bit of control over the process. Um, and, and I think you do have to be, you're very mature because you were able to do that. You were able to sit down with someone and trust them and say, okay, I'm going to take on board what you're saying. And we're, go we're going to make this better. We're well, going to I make this better. told you about the amount of people I didn't let them. Um, oh. <laughs> you would say, oh, you've got to say how to become a millionaire in four steps. And I was like, not offering that. Oh, you've yeah. got to put, you know, this. I'm going, it's not what it's about. Oh, you've got to restructure. So they, I did show it to a lot of, in fact, anybody who'd stand still long enough. I was like, have a look. Have a look. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, but I had to find someone who was looking at it from this you know changing the conversation about debt and advertising yes. and use that phrase and I thought that's what I'm doing I'm not promising millions I'm not saying you know whatever what I'm saying and you'll see story after story as people are maybe not earning that much more but they're having such a fabulous time with their job their career whatever it is that they've changed to that suddenly they're not spending the whole of their weekends cruising high streets, spending on rubbish. Yes. And that to me is much more what I'm promising. Yes. Is and that's a, that's a fresh new discussion. It's actually a very obvious discussion that people should have been having. And anyone who's found themselves in crisis, in crisis, either because of divorce or because of um, their business going into liquidation, they'll find that that is probably the thing they're really looking for. But everybody else around them keeps saying, oh, no, you've got to get back on top of your tree. Well, what exactly does that mean? And is that even possible at a certain age? Because, you know, I'm 55 now. I know I've got to start thinking about the future and money in a totally different way to when I was 35, you know, because I know I'm on a clock, <laughs> like it or not. One of the guys that I work with, um, he came to me, he was 73, he was an artist, he was a contemporary of Lucian Freud's and anyway, they used to hang out together and he was just about to lose everything. Anyway, we worked together and uh, he was very good. He got himself some teaching work and negotiated stuff. And um, anyway, it took about five, six years. He found out his market, he did street art um big big uh, metal structures and he found out that his market was in india who knew and he went yes. to india and um he was living in hotels he had cotton cold, cold running servants looking after him. he loved it he was so happy he got um cancer and he chose to die there rather than here because he just loved it so much he was so happy he was respected now i would say his income in india was probably lower than had he been doing the same thing here but 
he got everything he wanted. He had a happy life. He was treated with respect. He was invited to events and he died in his world, a very celebrated artist. Who knew? Who knew? But that man died happy. Um, and I, th I think he was 86 or something. And this is another guy who died uh, Christmas before last. It's similar but different. He was a student three PhDs or something. Anyway, he finally wrote a book about this place in, in um, Africa to do with gems, that who knew? And again, so happy, surrounded by people that loved him, who respected him, and he, you know, faded away with, I think he had pancreas, something horrid. Anyway, he did die and it wasn't too bad, but that it wasn't about the money. No. Being no. in debt prevented him from having this wonderful life and always yeah. had done. Yeah. In chapter six, you make a point, which I think it kind of ties in with that. And it's a really good one. Most people would rather talk about the most intimate aspects of their sex lives than their debt. And they bloody do. <laughs> I'm like, mate, I don't need to know about that. I want you to tell me how much is your rent and they'll go off talking about <laughs> how much do you earn and they'll go off to talk about please I don't want to hear about your sex life you know that's a separate workshop what we're doing here how much do you earn how much do you spend what do you want to do I mean you see in the um in the spreadsheets I talk about the blue categories the green categories and the pink categories yes um and the pink categories the only purpose of those categories is to bring you joy and you watch someone who ha and this is one of the biggest signifiers you say to someone what gives you joy and you watch them literally go they've eaten six sour lemons they've kind of turned pretzel shaped and they I don't know and you go exactly that's the thing until we can get you more and more comfortable in and it could be a bunch of flowers I never would have flowers in my home unless people were visiting so that they could be impressed that I had flowers in my home huh? <laughs> I know it, it's it's just it, it, from I, I we don't want to give away too much because this is the most fantastic read but I would just say to people, please, 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 if you want to find out more real expert advice on behaviors, how to manage your behaviors, to see the first glimmers, the first signs of debt becoming an issue, Sabrina George is an absolute must read. You can find the debtologist.com is your website, isn't it? Yes, that's talk about social media. That's pretty rubbish. The best thing is to get it off Amazon for now. We're working on getting the website better, but for now, just go to Amazon and get the Debtologist. And I'm hoping to put more and more up on social media of, you know, me talking, doing YouTube. That would be wonderful because Sabrina, uh, uh, of all the people in this area, you have the most to offer. And I think it's the most immediately impactful and relevant. And it's, uh, it's been a joy talking to you today. I'm so glad that we finally got talking. We've been Facebook friends for ages. <laughs> But I never actually got talking to you properly before. And this has been, it's been really, really enjoyable talking to you. Thank you so much for Thank coming you. on Writer's Block. And, and I really want to hear more about your, uh, your process because I find it fascinating. Other people, oh. like how you got to this as well. I think. Oh, well, really thank you very much. Stories are great, but stories, you know, they connect people, don't they? And, and that's really important as well. And this, the, this book is really relevant. And, and in a, just, to, just if we could just leave on this with a final comment on this. You've, you've launched this book now, just prior to COVID. Well, no, it was two weeks ago, I think, yeah. Oh, two yeah. weeks ago. Well, yeah. right in COVID. I know. Who would have thought? Have, is there anything in particular that you'd want to leave us with, with regard to debt and, and COVID at the moment? Anything that springs to mind, that's preying on your mind at the moment with regard to debtors and their behaviours in this I climate? Please believe your own evidence. So you do whatever you need to not borrow or debt. So if you need to grow vegetables and become a vegetarian for a week, whatever, just believe yourself try to keep all the conspiracy and all the noise um away um, yes. it's hard but i know so many people who've blossomed under covid they've just gone oh my god i've always wanted to do this or this has happened even the guy um, my street cleaner he said he's taken up a whole second career 
on top of street cleaning and he's going I don't know whether it's going to work I won't tell you what it is because it might get him in trouble but I'm just like whoa 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 there's a lot going on where people have just gone I'll use this as a reason to yes. change my life isn't and it extraordinary how a crisis can actually have this rebirth effect you know actually giving us a, a, a way forward one door closes another window opens but please everybody all our listeners and viewers please have a look at the debtologist it's a wonderful book well worth the read sabrina george thank you so much for coming on the show thank today you, darling thank you so much thank you thank you loved it loved it thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the weekend this will be up on sunday oh yes <laughs> bye bye thank Love you it, Bye-bye. Sabrina George was in conversation with Miriam Kilmurray on Writer's Block.